Hey everybody, what's up? It's John here uh, uh, coming at you with a uh, kind of a new video today. So basically, um, what uh, I've kind of discovered is uh, I think there's a, a little bit of a problem. I've noticed on social media a lot of people talking about you know all the trading that they do and and they're using all these you know sites out there to help them identify you know new trades to make and you know I'm personally not not a trader I, I don't go into positions and, and exit them in the same day or even in a couple days um, and there's nothing wrong with that uh, you know I can't really say that there is I, I can't imagine that I would say there's anything wrong with it anyway because I've never been successful at doing it and I really haven't tried it I've always been more of an investor but um, I do think that uh, you know it is a little bit of a, a kind of an issue if there's a lot of high frequency trading and a lot of traders because Basically, uh, it's really not that um, high quality of a life, number one. And then number two, uh, I actually have another video I did earlier, and I'll put it in the description area. Uh, I saw Kevin O'Leary say this, and, and I kind of backed it up with, with doing a little, a little bit of research. But there was nine, the majority of the gains of 2020 came in 19 trading days. So if you aren't already in those positions, you weren't along those positions, you're going to miss out on a lot of those gains. Yeah, you can get in those gains, you know, in the morning and then get out in the afternoon, but you're missing the bulk of, um, you know, you're missing the bulk of that upside, right? So the way that uh, I solve this problem is, you know, really two things, right? It's, it's it, in my view, it's, it's not a very high quality of life to be in and out of, you know, trading positions every day or every other day. Uh, and then number two, you're missing out on the big gains when they happen in really only 19 trading sessions of 2020. The way that you solve it is you be um, basically a uh, you know a modern day public market VC, right? Uh, and in a way, um, that's actually today in the year here at the time of this recording. It's uh, Friday, February nineteenth, twenty twenty one. We never know how well the markets are going to do in the future, but basically. Uh, American business and the companies in the S&P 500 will always continue to do well. Uh, in fact, I've got a quote, I don't have it today uh, on this video, but I've got a quote from, from Warren Buffett that if you basically, uh, right after the World War II in 1945, um, had you invested uh, in the S&P 500 um, versus gold, like if you got worried about the war and stuff, um, you would have returned uh, 10 cents for every dollar you returned in gold versus the S&P 500. So as a, you know, investing in American business companies that make it into the S&P 500 is, you know, the way to go. But you can do, you can basically take that up, you know, several levels and you can be more of, um, you know, a modern day public market VC, right? And the reality is, is the VCs, yeah, they do have a lot of op times where they get thousand percent, 10,000 percent, you know, really, really high returns and angels get that as well. Um, but, but basically, you know, if you find companies and the uh, strategy that I've been focusing on for a while is really find them, um, you know, when uh, around the time that they hit a billion dollars in sales. Because if you think about, you know, obviously not every company is going to become Apple or Microsoft or, you know, Facebook or Google. But if you could, could, if you could invest in those right when they hit about a billion dollars in sales and then ride that all the way up, you're going to have yourself a great investment. That's actually what I did with Netflix. And I still have Netflix, right? And I uh, began my Netflix investment in 2011 or 2012, and at that time they had about three billion dollars in sales, and their market cap was was also three billion. Uh, and even now they just, uh, you know, in the end of 2020 they did about 20 billion in sales, and are projecting to do, uh, you know, 25 in uh, in the end of 2021. So they're you know really really growing, and uh, I certainly still have some Netflix, but I I, I have them kind of compartmentalized um, as uh, kind of a uh, larger company, kind of not as high growth as some of the younger ones. But basically, um, I want to take you in and show you a quick clip here with uh, Mark Andreessen. And um, I'm watching Mark Andreessen quite a bit because Mark, uh, uh, ha I have a lot of years of Mark talking about Bitcoin and I'm going to do some Bitcoin videos with Mark. But I want to hear, um, I want you to hear what he has to say in terms of how they select um, you know, a company as a VC and how many they actually interview and how many they actually make an investment in. Okay, so here we go. And making investment decisions in the context of venture and fintech. And so we, we as a firm, just as background, we see 2,000 qualified inbound pitches a year, in, a, in an average year. Uh, in total across the firm, we make maybe 20 new, 20 new investments, 30 new investments. So it's about a 1% harvest rate. 
off of referred in, inbound deals. And so this, this is stuff coming to us from people we know. This is not stuff coming in over the transom or coming in cold. So it's already kind of a pre-selected set when it's the 2000. Um, in FinTech, you guys are probably seeing 300 or something out of that or 400 or something yeah, number least, like that. Yeah. Hundred, hundreds, multiple hundreds for sure. Um, and then, you know, in, in, in our FinTech practice today, we can make a handful of bets a year. Right. You know, five, you know, five to ten, something like that, maybe total. Um, so maybe describe the process uh, that you and Angela used to titrate from, let's call it a funnel of like 400 inbound, ultimately down to maybe five to ten outcomes. Like, and, and I would say in two parts, kind of what gets knocked out early, um, and then when it gets down to the set where these are all clearly, you know, high-quality opportunities, how, how, do we, how do we make the final decision? Oh, shoot, now I have to admit that I have no process. So we get monkeys. <laughs> From the San Francisco Zoo, we get a dartboard, and yes. then we just go. Uh, the challenge in venture, as in active stock. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so the point of that is just so you can see that um, what he's talking about, where they get 2,000 inbound groups uh, that are pitching themselves to Mark Andreessen uh, and their venture capital company. And, you know, that's, that's, that's referrals of people that they know, and they, they choose 1%. So what happens, everybody, is that 1% that they choose, they make those investments. There's still a very, very small percentage of that 1% that actually, number one, even make their money back, and number two, give them a return. The reality is with venture capital that they only need, like I think, 10 to 20% of their investments to actually be superstars to, to basically make a solid return of 25 to 30% a year. Um, I went ahead and I found a little clip here, uh, not a clip, um, uh, um, a little review from the Harvard Business Review, where um, we talk about what they actually what what happens with respect to these um, companies uh, after they invest in them, right? So basically, uh, this is from the Harvard Business Review. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it's a really you know long article, but just to show you kind of what that real percentage is, kind of post investment, post you know from 2,000 down to 20 investments, and then post invested in those 20 companies. So basically. Uh, you know, here we go. Uh, on average, good plans, people, and businesses succeed only one in ten times. To see why, I consider there are many component uh, components critical to a company's success. The best companies might have eighty percent probability of succeeding at each of them, but even with these odds, the probability of eventual success will be less than twenty percent. So, less than twenty percent, everybody. So, basically. Uh, if one of the variables drops to 50% probability, the combined chances of success falls to 10%. The odds play out in venture capital portfolios. So basically, um, more than half <clears throat> the companies will at best return only the original investment and at worst be a total loss. Given the portfolio approach and the deal structure VCs use, however, only 10 to 20% of the companies funded need to be real winners to achieve the targeted return rate of 25 to 30% a year. So, you know, we, we've been in a bull market since 2009, and certainly the stock market's been kind of crazy since 2020. Um, but in, in terms of, you know, what, uh, what I'm doing as, as, as just a single kind of a public market VC in that model of trying to find that, you know, uh, that company that, that really makes sense, where I've got at least some contextual experience with, they've recently hit a billion dollars in sales, and they can really kind of, you know, grow up to those those high levels of, you know, like I said, right now, uh, Netflix is at about 20 billion in sales. And when I invested in them in 2012, they were about um, 3 billion in sales. So that's 3 billion up to 20. So, you know, you figure maybe they can 10x their sales. Um, just to give you an example, one of the investment I really like right now is Roku. I'm sure a lot of other people like that investment as well. But with respect to Roku, uh, they just released their earnings today. Again, it's Friday, February 19th. They released their earnings yesterday. Uh, Thursday, February 18th, after the market. And right now, Roku uh, is is basically, uh, I took a look before I did this video, and my returns uh, a little bit over 150%. Now, I have several different positions where I, I, over time, I take positions, and I started investing in Roku back in late 2017. So some of those positions from late 2017 are actually higher than 150%, but then the recent positions are you know, certainly much lower than, than 150%. But right now, I've got Roku at about 12.5% uh, of my portfolio in general. But if you take a look at it, they just uh, did their... Um, they just did their uh, earnings release. I'm going to take you in there real quick. So... Um, and again, this is really just an example of, of the opportunity to nowadays be, you know, your own little 
uh, you know, public, uh, public market VC, you know, because you don't have to, you know, do that selection process of 2000 companies down to 20 and then have the risk of only 10% of, of them even, you know, giving you a return. You could just, you know, in, invest in, in the good companies and go for, you know, 1 billion in sales. You have contextual experience. Um, and then try to, if you can, try to get them at 20 billion market cap or less, um, you know, so that you can have, you know, that nice, that nice return uh, on the way up. Uh, so anyway, so let's go into some of these Roku numbers. So basically, fourth quarter EBITDA, which stands for, in, in case you don't know, uh, earnings before uh, interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization uh, of $113.5 million was nearly three times higher uh, than expected. They were actually, uh, my understanding is they weren't even expected to, to you know, produce, you know, even have uh, a net income for the fourth quarter, but they did. So then if you take a look at uh, Roku over here on their um, their investors uh, relations uh, deck, they have, uh, they did, uh, let's see, full year, um, let me get to it. Full year 2020 revenue, uh, they actually call it net revenue. I don't, I'm not really sure why they call it net revenue, but it was $1,778,388, right? So $1.7 billion. And 2019 full year, uh, again, I was invested in Roku uh, before 2019, more like you know late 2017, early 2018. Um, they just had crossed over that $1 billion mark, so about $1,128,000. Uh, for Roku. Um, and if you take a look at their gross profits, uh, and again, that's another thing I really look at. I really like to see some solid gross profits. They're at uh, 802. Yeah, 45.5% gross, prof, gross profits in 2020 and then 2019. 495224 divided by 1128921 43. So they're actually their gross profits are a little bit higher here in um uh here in 2020. So there you go. So uh, that's the problem that I see is is all the high frequency trading. I mean if you're you know doing a lot of high frequency trading and, and you're doing great, great for you. Um but basically you should take some of those wins and you should stock them away and have some safe investments with those. Um, and, and if you're not, I mean, why not have, you know, my view, a, a, a higher quality of life uh, where you can, you know, make some solid investments and then just let those ride and really always limit your exposure. I mean, if you want to try something new, limit your exposure, you know, only go in at uh, two and a half percent of your portfolio. Uh, even with respect to, to Roku, I've gone up to 12 and a half percent. I made another investment in, uh, in actually, uh, you know, something kind of exciting, you know, <laughs> here on the internet, but I'm going to basically match that investment that I did where I'm going to do half uh, of that investment, half of the seven and a half thousand, you know, with just more Roku stock. And then the other half of that seven and a half thousand with Roku options. And I'm not really that into options, but I am going to get some more, um, some Roku options to see how they do in about a year from now. So, um, yeah, so it's just a better quality of life. If you can do that, you limit your exposure. And if it starts to do well and you believe in the company and you think that that's really going to grow, you can just keep upping it, you know, upping it to, to five and then seven and a half and then 10. And then that way you're, you're really, you know, limiting, you know, your exposure. I mean, I've developed this philosophy over many years. I mean, I, I actually traded the internet stocks back in uh, the late nineties and, and 2000 and got, you know, crushed and back then, I'm, you know, investing in all these companies that, you know, you get really excited about kind of like I see happening today. Um, these people, they're looking at stocks like their jewelry and, and they don't even know what the company does. And uh, I not, don't really think, well, I imagine it's not a very good recipe uh, because, you know, you really have to know, you know, what you're investing in. I mean, you're not going to go out there. Most people aren't going to go out there and just buy a car and, and not really care, you know, what kind of car it is or, you know, if it's new or if it's used or, or what condition it's in or, you know, what the, the price you're paying for the car is and relative to its fair value. It's really the same thing. You've got to know what you're buying. So uh, there you go. So that is uh, our video today. And it's uh, why be a trader when you can be a modern day uh, public market mini venture capitalist and take these companies and ride them from 1 billion in sales all the way up to 20 to 100 or even more billion in sales and uh, you know return yourself a great investment that way. All right, I hope you guys like that. Thank you so much and uh, also, um, I just came out with a uh, blueprint, uh, and that blueprint uh, covers investing, of course, uh, online income. I do a lot with respect to online income. I've got YouTube Cash Cow channels. Um, I also uh, have been a you know lead generator for 
over a decade, uh, I do a lot with respect to internet marketing. Um, and so this blueprint covers online marketing. Uh, it also covers credit, business credit, financial independence. And at the very end, I've got actually kind of a big guide. It's about a 15 page guide on all the groups in the US that offer a free credit score, plus all the groups that offer a free FICO and the corresponding uh, bureau with that FICO. For example, you know, you need to have you know, basically you need to know what the three uh, bureaus are, right? Uh, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. So each of the free um, FICO scores I give you have, will we'll, we'll show you the groups and then the corresponding bureaus so that you can get a free FICO from, from each bureau and have know what your three FICOs are uh, at all times for free. Okay, I hope you guys liked it. Have a great weekend and thank you.